This is my 2022 Tesla Model 3 long range after one year, 30,000 miles, one cross country road trip, and one accident. In this video, I'll talk about cost, maintenance, repairs, road tripping, what I like and don't like, and if I would buy it again. Now, when I bought this car brand new, it was 54,490, which seems like a lot by today's standards because it probably is. Today, you can get a Model 3 long range for about $47,000, and that's before any tax incentives. But it's not the same car completely. In 2022, when I got my car, it came with 358 miles of range in a full charge. Today, the Model 3 long range comes with 333 miles of range in a full charge. Still plenty of battery, but not as much as the 2022 model. Now, when we talk about miles per range in a full charge, we have to mention battery degradation, especially over years of ownership. So what does that look like with Teslas? There was an article released that Tesla's over 200,000 miles of range and ownership lose about 12% of their battery. Now keep in mind this article does reference older Model S's and Model X's. However, if we do go by that loss of degradation, that rate, that's about 1% of battery lost every 16.6 thousand miles. So for me, after 30,000 miles of driving, I would have lost almost 2% of my total range, which means if I were to charge my battery to 100%, I'd probably get about 351 miles out of it, which compared to 358 brand new is not bad at all. And the reason I can't just charge my car to 100% and look at the mileage is because that is a rated mileage estimate, meaning it's based on how I drive and how many miles I would get based on my driving style on a full charge. It's not the EPA estimated range that Tesla uses when they sell new cars. So now let's talk maintenance and repairs. I do have to mention a day after I got this car, I got in a car accident. It wasn't my fault. My car was completely parked legally on the side of the road, but this happened. Someone backed into my car literally 14 hours after I picked it up. So I had to deal with that. So my car does have an excellent history, I believe, but it wasn't my fault. I don't know if you would count that as a maintenance or repair because I paid nothing for it. It went all through the other person's insurance company. But one thing I do want to mention that seems unique to my car, I had some flapping noises about a week after I got the car when I go up to 40, 50, 60 miles per hour. It sounded like something between the tire and the front fender here was just kind of flapping back and forth. Like you'd hear it in the wind and make this flapping sound. It wasn't too loud, but it was something where when the music was down, you would, you would hear it. it. It was coming from this side of the car. It's very unique. Now, luckily, this was something that was covered by Tesla warranty. So I just had to make an appointment, bring it in, get it serviced. They gave me a Model Y rental for like half a day and I got it repaired the same day. And as far as maintenance goes, I mean, guys, besides changing the windshield washer fluid, I haven't really done much to this car. I honestly have not even rotated the tires. I probably should have by now. I don't know what's going to happen, but I haven't even done that yet. I just put windshield washer fluid in there and nothing else really happened to the car I had to pay for. So I spent zero dollars out of pocket for this car after a year of owning it. But I want to clarify as well, I probably could have and should have spent some money on it. You see this right here? That's a curb rash. And on Teslas, they're very, very common. People say that to tell a difference between someone who owns a Tesla and someone who rents it through Hertz, you can see curb rashes like this all around the rim on the rental car. It's just because it's so easy to have it done. You know, if you drive a normal car, you'll rub your tire against the curb and it'll you know, leave a scratch or a mark on the tire, but the rim is totally fine. On Tesla's here, what happens is that the rim is just a little bit further out than the tire. So if you do touch a curb, it's the rim that's touching first. So you'll get these curb rashes. And I, I was debating um, getting it fixed when it first happened. I ended up not doing it. And I'm glad I didn't because I've had it happen like three or four more times since. And, you know, I scratch it out a little bit, try to rub it out, make it look nice. But I don't know if it's worth repairing because it's bound to happen again at some point. Now the performance for this car, it does zero to 60 in 4.2 seconds. And I gotta say, after a year of owning it, that does not get old. What's even more impressive than zero to 60, I believe is a 30 to 60 or 40 to 60, that quick acceleration when you tap or push the accelerator, just how quickly the car responds to the torque with it. It's super, it's awesome. It doesn't get old, I love it. It's something that's super unique to electric cars, Teslas maybe in general, but coming from a Kia Forte where you had to, you know, if I was going to change lanes, I had to look over and plan ahead. If I have an open room and I want to get in there quick, I can get in there super fast and I love it. That never gets old. But I do have to say with the Tesla 2022 and the newer models, they're both 4.2 0 to 60. 
but you do have the option for the acceleration boost, which takes that time from 4.2 to 3.7. I haven't tried it out yet, I haven't gotten it, I've been very, very tempted just because I really love the performance of this car. So maybe stay tuned for a future video with that once I get it. But um, I gotta say that 4.2 does not get old even after a year of driving it. Now let's talk charging for a second. So I charge at home on a standard 110 volt outlet, which gets me about 5 miles per hour of charging. And overnight for most people, including myself, that's plenty of miles to get to work and home every day, and maybe some driving afterwards as well. Now, in extreme cases, which might be my case actually more recently, I do drive for work. So I'm driving 40, 50, 60 plus miles a day sometimes in my longer days, and sometimes five miles an hour with overnight charging just isn't enough to fully get back to 80% of charge. And I say 80% because it's very important for Tesla owners, especially with the long range models here. They don't want you charging to 100% on daily driving. So if you're going for a road trip and want to fully charge, that's great, that's fine. But for daily driving to preserve your battery for long term, they recommend charging to 80% at most. So if you drive a lot like myself, getting five miles an hour at home with charging, if it's not enough for you, you can definitely upgrade to a 240 outlet and get a full charge in about six hours. For me, I can still get away with the 110 volt standard outlet. I do have to go to a supercharger maybe once every two or three weeks, so I don't really mind that at all right now. And of course, that comes with cost too, right? So the cost of charging in the Tesla app, it shows me I've paid over the past year $1,383 in electricity for charging. That includes at home and supercharging. Now that may or may not sound like a lot of money, but when you compare it to what I would have spent with how much I drive in gas, I saved over $2,600. At this rate, that would be about $16,000 in savings over the next six years. And keep in mind too, I do drive a lot. I've driven this 30,000 miles over the past year. So for me, that's a ton of savings. Now exterior looks, you can be the judge yourself. I think it's very subjective, but there are a lot of changes coming out with the new Tesla Model 3 Project Highland. A lot of rumors about what that will look like. There will be some changes with the headlights and the taillights, the front and rear of the car. But as far as the looks go, I'm obviously a pretty big fan and I don't think it's something that's really right or wrong. I think we all have our opinions, but subjectively, I really like the looks of this car and it's held up really well after a year. As far as interior design goes, the leather's held up really well in the Las Vegas heat after one year and 30,000 miles. You'll see some creasing here on the edge of the seats from people getting in and out and smashing the seats over like this, but overall, the entirety of the seat especially if there's stains that are here. This is from dog slobber, but it's not washed. If you had to wash it, it comes out very, very easily. Now I have the black interior, obviously, and I had a concern in the heat, in the Vegas heat, whether it would be super hot when you get in the car, right? If you sit down, it's 100 degrees outside, these seats might burn you, but I haven't had that issue. Now I have tint all on my car, the roof, the windshield, all the windows, and I have this handy thing right here, which is normal in Vegas to have to cover the windshield. So I haven't had that issue of sitting down and having the seats burn me, but I did hear one thing to keep in mind if you live in a hot weather climate. This computer, I was told, gets very, very hot. So although the temperature inside the car won't affect it too much, what really impacts the computer is if there's sun beating down on it for hours at a time. That's why something like this here is very, very useful to, you know, if the sun's sitting up right at noon, three, four o'clock, just beating on your car, you wanna have this to cover your windshield to keep this nice and cool. If the interior of your car is 140 degrees, 150 degrees, it looks really, really hot. This won't be affected by that. What affects this is the sun itself. Now let's bring you inside to talk about autopilot, probably what Teslas are most known for. Now, besides a few phantom brakes here and there, by phantom brakes, I mean when you're on the expressway and there's nobody around you, but the car decides to brake a little bit or a lot of it. Besides that, Autopilot is an absolute game changer and a lifesaver, especially on road trips. And Autopilot comes standard on every single Tesla, which is amazing. You can upgrade to full self-driving for about $15,000, not about, actually exactly $15,000 right now. The price continues to go up. And we had a version of full self-driving. We bought them monthly for our long road trip. And I gotta say, I do not think it was worth it at all. For $15,000, it's not perfect, it's not autonomous, I might get some hate for that, but robo-taxis are not anywhere close, I don't believe, to being a realistic thing for Tesla. So autopilot is great, it's super helpful, it works great 99% of the time on the highways. The full self-driving for the extra $15,000 for most people may not be worth it. 
And speaking of road trips, let's talk about that for a second. So we went on a 4,000 mile road trip from Las Vegas to Chicago and back in the middle of winter. There was a winter storm where temperatures were single digit degrees on most of our trip. And Teslas do lose a little bit of range when it gets colder out. So for people who might have been concerned with that range, we made that trip just fine. Something that I did not consider when I bought a Tesla, but the supercharging network, super reliable, super quick. They're all over the place. And when you compare us to the supercharging network of Teslas versus the Electrify America, the charge point and other networks that other EVs have to use, you're really gonna be grateful when you find out just how often those don't work, those don't get the full rate of charging. You have to charge slower for longer. And Tesla's just so reliable with their charging network and it was super helpful on our road trip. So I can't tell you exactly how much real world range we were getting when it was super cold outside and we were road tripping this thing across the country, but I will say that we never had any issue where we were worried about not making it to the next supercharger. We were actually skipping superchargers here and there because there's so many of them on the interstates here in the US that you know they're even if they're 100 miles away, we have way more than that and we can skip that when we get to the next one. So I gotta say the supercharging network just itself is super, super great and something that I didn't even consider when I was buying a Tesla. But you know, when I eventually decide to buy this car or another car in the future, um, it, it's huge. It's huge, especially if you like going on road trips because that you know, if you have to go to an EA supercharger or not, not a supercharger, an EA charger, and you got to wait there for an hour because only two are working out of the six, and they're only charging at like 40 kilowatts, it, it could ruin your trip. And here, when we took it across the country, we never had a wait at a supercharger. We had one wait for like five minutes. Uh, each one we went to, even though it was a middle of a winter storm, they all worked. They all got a really fast charge, so I couldn't be more grateful for the supercharger network. So while our road trip was in almost sub-zero temperatures, we do live full-time here in Las Vegas where it is very often over 100, 110 degrees. So how has this car held up in the heat? Well, you see the interior of it, you would think with the heat over time, it kind of degrades the leather, it got some wrinkles in it. We have a little bit where we get in and out of the seats that you saw earlier. But other than that, the interior is held up really, really well. And what's really important for the winter are two things. One, you see the tint here on the windows, the windshield, and also an extra tint on the roof. Very helpful for keeping the car cool during the summer. And the app as well. The app has a climate control feature where you can control the climate of your car from anywhere. So if you're going you know, home from work, you get to your app five minutes before you get in the car and cool the car down, it really makes a difference. Now without all that and the black interior in this heat, I can't tell you if or if not it would make a difference sitting down on the, on the chair. I would imagine it would, but the climate control app comes in clutch, especially in climates that are super warm like here or super cold like the Midwest in winter. One more thing too I want to mention in terms of extreme weather. So we got the super cold, the super warm. In just these past few days here in Vegas, there was a huge storm and it flooded. I was driving this car through inches, if not about a foot of water on the street and handled it really, really well. So for those of you who think that Teslas can't operate in a little bit of rain or even a pretty severe flood, take a look at this footage and see for yourself just how well this car did. Now after a year, I gotta say the software of the Tesla and the Tesla app is something I appreciate a ton. And I don't think I could go back to any other car without having an app like the Tesla app that I can use to control just about everything in the car. Now there's fun things you can do like the fart mode and the speaker the voice activated stuff, but just the climate control itself is super, super helpful for the app, especially living here in Las Vegas. And on the topic of software, there's a lot of negative news about Tesla and their recalls, but at least as far as I've owned the car, I haven't myself or heard of any of my friends who also own Teslas had to bring their car in for a recall. Although they do have recalls because everything is fixed, not everything, but mostly everything that I've had so far has been updated or fixed through a software update overnight in my car, in my garage, connected to my Wi-Fi, which is incredibly convenient and I have to bring your car in for every little thing. And Tesla can do this for recalls or to just update their car and bring new features to the car or the app. And they're always improving. For example, I think about a week or two ago, they just started introducing shortcuts through your, uh, through your smartphone or through your Apple Watch as well. I have a Garmin, so I haven't used those, but it's just super convenient. You can control everything you can control from the app. You can now do it from your watch or from just one button on your phone. 
And when it comes to energy efficiency, the Tesla in-car also has a little efficiency app that I love to open. And for myself and other EV drivers who are new to the EV world, it shows you how much battery you're using, how much it predicts you'll use, and what exactly is causing your battery to be used. For example, if it's your driving, it'll show you how much percentage you use from driving. If it's your climate control, it shows you how much. And you know, say if you drove under 70 miles per hour, you would have saved this much battery or there was some wind from this direction that saved you or cost you this much percentage of your battery, which is all super insightful and gives you great tips how to save battery for long road trips and daily driving, which again, is just another example of the technology of the software that Tesla has that makes this car so unique. So let's wrap it up here with two of my favorite features that I have not yet mentioned in this video. The first being regenerative braking. I didn't know this again when I first got the car, but when you let go of the accelerator in any normal, normal gas car, the car would slow down just a little bit. But here in the Tesla, it actually applies a braking force, but it doesn't use the brake. What it does, it turns off the battery slightly. So you decelerate at a pretty good pace and it gives you energy back into your car. And it also allows you to never really ever have to use the brake pedal. Now, obviously it's there in extreme circumstances if you have to slam on the brake or decelerate hard. But for the most part, I really never touched a brake pedal, which again, over time, over years of owning it, I don't think I'll ever have to replace the brakes with how little I use it. And number two are both camp mode and dog mode. So we have a dog here. You saw him walk by earlier. Um, you can leave the car, go grocery shopping, go use the bathroom, go, you know, whatever on a road trip. And from your app, you can keep the cabin at a certain temperature. And on the screen, it says the dog mode, the climate control is activated. It shows the temperature inside the car. So people who are walking by and see your dog in the car, don't think that, you know, the windows are rolled up and it's super hot. It shows the temperature in the car. It's super convenient. You control it from the app. You can see the in-cabin camera now, so you can watch your dog while you're in the grocery store or something like that. So it's super cool. And then camp mode as well. It's the same exact thing. It keeps the climate control at a certain temperature unless you sleep in the car overnight. And you know, whether it's hot outside, it needs AC, or whether it's cold outside, it needs the heat. It'll do that automatically for you overnight. So you can just camp in this car super easily, super convenient. I'm not much of a camper. We've used it twice now and we love that feature. We've only camped because of that feature. So it's super cool to have and it's something that I want to take advantage more as I own this car. Now, after all of that, the age old question, would I buy this car again if I had the chance? A year ago, I would say yes. In the future, four, five, six, whatever years from now, the answer is no. And it's not because why you think it is. Obviously, with all I've mentioned, I love this car. I wouldn't get anything other than a Tesla, maybe for forever, we'll see. But the reason it's a no, because I have my eyes set on a Model S Plaid. I told you before how much I love the acceleration of this thing, the performance of it. I don't know what my money situation will be like in a few years, but if I can afford a Model S Plaid over a Model 3, I'm for sure gonna take it. But as far as the Tesla technology, the Tesla supercharging infrastructure and everything else this car has to offer, I definitely do want to stay in the Tesla brand. Now, I may be biased, I understand, so I do want to wrap up with the second opinions. Let's ask this stranger sitting down here on the curb. Would you buy anything other than a Tesla for your next car? No. Why? It's more convenient and I feel like you'll save a lot of money with it. How? Because it's so cheap to like charge your car and low maintenance and I don't know, just in general. And, and I feel like we're safe there and it, it shows the proof that we were able to bring the car Vegas to Chicago and Chicago to Vegas. On a road trip? On a road trip. That was yeah. fun, huh? And that was a lot of fun and it handled the heat, it handled the cold. All of it. And it's very sufficient and efficient. Sufficient and efficient. Yeah. Look at that. Well, that you heard sense, it here, right? folks. That makes sense. That makes sense. You heard it here. Thank you for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.